think we'll let people sit down. Good morning, my name is Alessandro Merli. I'm the Frankfurt correspondent of Il Sole 24 Ore, the Italian financial daily, and I'm here to uh, coordinate the next uh, session, which will be on uh, European Banking Union, a subject that was already touched upon uh, in the workshops yesterday. I would like, first of all, to thank the organizer for inviting us uh, to discuss uh, this topic, and uh, I must say that the timing was impeccable. Uh, our meeting here is sandwiched uh, right in between uh, uh, the latest ECOFI meeting, which discussed the subject, and the uh, meeting of another ECOFIN and uh, the European uh, Council uh, uh, Summit, which will happen at the end of next week, which is supposed to take some uh, decisions on, on this. Uh, so congratulations to the organizer for the, uh, for the timing. Why are we discussing the banking union and why now? Uh, I had an interview with the president of the Bundesbank last week, Jens Weidmann, and he told me, he was reminding me that at the very beginning of the monetary union, uh, Wim Doisenberg, the first uh, head of the European Central Banks, uh, used to underline the importance of having a banking union, and this was uh, uh, 12 or 13 years ago, but uh, we've come to discuss uh, uh, this now. Uh, why? Because after the crisis, I guess, uh, uh, it was apparent that uh, a fragmented uh, uh, banking system and this loop between the uh, sovereign debt and uh, the state of health of the uh, banks uh, uh, could make uh, the monetary union itself uh, uh, unsustainable. To discuss this uh, with us today, we have a very distinguished uh, panel on uh, with uh, different uh, skills. Uh, on my immediate uh, left uh, is Benoit Corre, he's a member of the executive uh, board of the European Central Bank now for about two years. He has had a long career at the French Treasury, including uh, working on G8 and G20s, and uh, uh, he has something that's, uh, I think, uh, almost unique among uh, policy makers in Europe in the sense that uh, he has a background in Japanese studies which uh, should serve him well in the current crisis, uh, which uh, many people uh, uh, think uh, it's uh, very similar to the one that, uh, the, uh, that Japan experienced in the past uh, two decades. Uh, on his left is Philip Hildebrand, he's now the vice chairman of BlackRock, uh, one of the biggest asset managers in the world. Uh, he was also the chairman of the Swiss National Bank, and in this capacity, he had to deal with the, uh, in a country that has very big banks, uh, actually uh, banks that are, uh, in relative terms, uh, maybe almost too big for the, for the economy, he was also very much involved uh, in uh, uh, international regulation efforts after the global crisis and the Financial Stability Board. He also has previous experience as a hedge fund manager. Uh, on his left uh, is Konstantin von Horsterreich. Uh, uh, he's the chairman of the management board of HSH Nordbank Bank uh, uh, since 2012, and previously uh, with the same institution. He was chief risk officer and chief financial officer, but he also has a long a career uh, in uh, uh, private bank, uh, Deutsche Bank, uh, in various uh, uh, various positions. Uh, I would like to uh, skip introductory statements and start uh, uh, possibly with uh, Mr. Curry, uh, which uh, will sort of give us a report of the state of the banking union uh, after the recent developments in in Brussels and maybe looking forward to the uh, next uh, European Council. Thank you, thank you, Alessandro, and good morning to all of you. I have to say that you're very brave to be here uh, with this uh, sunny weather outside, so it's our duty to do our best to, to keep you entertained uh, and awake. Um, I think your, your description, uh, uh, Alessandro, of why the, the banking union is, is needed uh, was, uh, was really up to the point. 
uh, we need the banking union to, uh, to uh, disconnect uh, the fate of European banks from the fate of their governments. And we've seen how the, this, this feedback loop was uh, really at the heart of the, of the crisis. And, but for that, we need two things. Uh, we need supervisors to have a European mandate instead of a national mandate, and that's about the supervisory mechanism, and that's why we have a single supervisory mechanism. We also need European banks, uh, when they die, uh, when, they, uh, when they are wound up, uh, to, uh, to be in the hands of a European uh, resolution authority, and that's also why, why we need a single resolution mechanism. So we need both, actually, if we want to, uh, to disconnect uh, banks and sovereigns. And uh, <coughs> the, um, the former Bank of England governor, Mervyn King, used to say, uh, banks are global in life, but they are national in death, meaning that when they die, this is about taxpayers' money, and it's national taxpayers' money. So we want to make sure that banks are global in life, or European in life, or whatever they decide, that's their business choice, but that they are European in death, not, not anymore national in death. And that's very important. So where do we stand? Uh, we have a single supervisory mechanism, it's now coming. Uh, we have a law, a European law. We have a president of the uh, ECB supervisory board, Madame Nouy, uh, who's been uh, confirmed by the European Parliament. Uh, we've uh, done a lot of work already at the ECB to, to set it up. Um, we've started uh, hiring people, uh, looking for new premises, uh, uh, wiring, wiring the IT, etc. I mean, that's, we're not going to talk about that this morning, I guess, but uh, it is, of course, very important. Uh, and it's, uh, it's about 1,000 people that will be hired in Frankfurt uh, uh, as part of this new mechanism. So that's an enormous change for the ECB as an institution, and we want to get it right also in terms of, in terms of culture. We want this new uh, institution to have a true European culture. We, want, we don't want this new supervisory board to, to be just a committee of national supervisors, because that would be a failure. We want them to, to be working in the European spirit as the governing council of the ECB works in the European spirit. So that's the first challenge. But it is there, it is coming, and uh, the priority of the new mechanism next year uh, will be to uh, undertake uh, a comprehensive assessment of the balance sheet of uh, European banks. Uh, and this will be for those banks that will be directly supervised by the ECB, around 130 banks directly supervised by the ECB. And there will be first a risk assessment, second uh, an asset quality review, and third a stress test, which will be more, more, more generally coordinated by the uh, European Banking Authority. So this will be for the whole of the EU. So these are started, it is now, it is now material. So really 2013 is a year where the a uh, single supervisory mechanism has stopped being a concept and has uh, really moved into reality. Now we need a single resolution mechanism, as I said. Uh, it's really an ongoing discussion among ministers, uh, and uh, as you as you as you recalled us, it's a it's taking place now. Uh, there have been several days and nights of discussions this week in Brussels uh, and in other places. Uh, next week uh, also. Um, what we would like to see at the ECB is a true uh, European mechanism uh, with a resolution board having the authority to close banks and having the ability to close banks in a, in a swift way. And let's not forget that this is about crisis management. So they have to be, uh, they have to be efficient, uh, they have to, to be, uh, to be uh, entrusted to do it, but they also have to be able to do it in a very quick, very efficient manner. So we need a governance mechanism that is lean, uh, that makes it possible to take uh, prompt decisions. And we need a single resolution fund, because that's the only way to disconnect uh, the liabilities of banks from the liabilities of sovereigns. So we need a single resolution fund that should be funded uh, by the industry, by a levy on the industry. Um, but in case, in particular initially, in case it would be too small, uh, we need a backstop that would be provided by the European Stability Mechanism. And we're not yet there. We're not yet there. So that's the, the, the challenge of the next, of the, of the next, of the few uh, uh, next days would be uh, for European ministers to agree on, on, on this comprehensive mechanism. Uh, I'm very, I'm very uh, confident that we'll come there. Will it be uh, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, or will it take a few more weeks? I don't know, but I very much hope that this will be settled uh, next week. Thank you. Uh, Philip, maybe you can give us the investor's view. Uh, one thing that the president of the ECB uh, Mario Draghi has said that the outset of these exercises of reviewing uh, the bank's balance sheet is that the success of this comprehensive assessment of the Eurozone banks uh, uh, will be determined by the 
willingness of investors to actually put money into uh, the European uh, banking sector. In the meantime, there is some movement in the market. Bank shares have gone up. Uh, I don't know if it's a function of uh, more confidence of people that uh, uh, this assessment will prove uh, right. Uh, what is your view on, on that? You know, the most important element, and, and this is very positive, is that the capital markets are open again for bank capital. Uh, this would not have been the case only a few months ago, frankly. If you even look at this week, we've had, or this uh, past week, we've had another capital issuance. We've seen a number of uh, convertible uh, bond issuance, COCOs that have been put out successfully. Uh, We've had at least six or seven banks that have been able to tap the markets in the last uh, couple of months. So I think it is clear that the markets are open. This is, of course, partly a reflection of the ongoing surge for yield of the very low interest rate environment as a result of QE. Uh, so it's hard to distinguish exactly how much is linked to confidence in the process towards a banking union, how much is a much broader phenomenon. There's no question that QE, um, not just in the US, but uh, of course in the UK and even in Japan, that this has helped pushing uh, investors into risky assets. That was the whole point of uh, unconventional monetary policy. And that is now feeding also through uh, some of the bank stocks uh, in Europe. But I think independently of that, it seems to me there is something separate going on namely a reassessment of the risks in the European banking system. And, and my conviction is that some of this has to do with the process that has been put into place, both longer term as well as shorter term, towards a banking union. I think the progress that seems to have been made on the resolution fund is another very important step. I agree with Beno, I think that's crucial moving forward. The credibility fact that given that the ECB is behind this, Mario Draghi with his personal credibility, I think is helping uh, slowly to convince markets that this is for real and that at some point by the end of next year or early 2015, the European banking system will be broadly speaking in a reasonably robust uh, position. So what you're beginning to see in anticipation of that is uh, the, the movement that I've mentioned uh, in the capital markets. So the key is to keep this process credible moving forward. It is, in many ways, it's a confidence game. Uh, the longer it lasts, the stronger the conviction will grow, um, and the more we will end up at the end of the process in a situation where one day we'll wake up and by and large people will say, you know what, the European system has stabilized. This is, of course, it's a very different process, unfortunately, than what we had in the US, where it virtually happened overnight at the time of the stress tests that Tim Geithner put into place in March 2009. It would be very nice if we had had something similar and if it weren't five years later, and we're still talking about the uh, robustness of the banking system. But we are where we are, and I am actually quite optimistic that provided all the parties keep on track now moving forward, that this gradual confidence game is gonna to begin to work. I was just in uh, Greece on Friday, and I can tell you even in Greece, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this, there are firm bids now from hedge funds, from institutional investors uh, that were put into the banking stabilization fund for uh, stakes that they would like to take these investors in. Uh, certainly at least two of the of the remaining four or five banks uh, in Greece. So I think there is there is fragile good news everywhere. The key now is to continue to make progress and not have setbacks and hopefully continue to operate in a global kind of rather positive market environment. Thank you. Uh, Mr. von Osterreich, if I can turn to you to have a banker's view now. Of course, people start about uh, talk about the start of this assessment uh, of, uh, of your balance sheets, or the, at least of the 128 banks that will be supervised directly by the, by the ECB. Uh, people don't realize that uh, this work is actually already started. The ECB has already met you in several meetings in Frankfurt. I think you were 
uh, there with the other German banks at one of the three meetings. Uh, you've also received a questionnaire from the ECB, which a lot of people, a lot of your colleagues tell me it's uh, quite complicated and they are taking a lot of time to uh, fill it. What are your first impressions on how this exercise has started and if it will respond to uh, expectations? Well, um, let me say the following. I ran a bank uh, which went substantially off rail after a failed IPO. So the regulators are all over us already. So we know <laughs> our figures. And that means uh, we can comply which we were asked for by the ECB. Um, and that kind of um, tells you what it means. It depends on how prepared you are. Those institutions who, during the crisis, um, have learned their books and have worked out how they have to go forward, have been recapitalized sufficiently, and have strong balance sheets, I mean strong common equity code, a sustainable leverage, those guys um, can be um, pretty sure that, that they will sail through successfully. Obviously, that I also have to admit, uh, we look a bit like a um, rabbit and snake, how that all will be happening. What is um, very important for us? Yes, many important milestones to the, on the way to the banking unit has been, have been taken, but implementation execution now is the name of the game, and that's where we are looking very much forward to, that we get a crisp and punchy um, roads of engagements and, um, obligation, and, and, and we know that our obligations, in other words, roles and responsibilities have to be very clear um, what we are afraid of, um, that there will be um, harsh, uh, that there will be lengthy and maybe um, not that precise. We are very much hoping forward, looking forward to get a much better regime, harmonized and fair to everybody, and that will make it for us much more predictable how to run a bank. So overall, we're very positive where the situation is concerned with obvious reservations, which is, which is clear. And I, I guess the time of moaning is um, very much over, um, and, and I would say we are now getting just on with it. Mr. Kure, you've alluded to the, a bit to the uh, ECB preparation for, for this. It's a huge logistical exercise for you, uh, also because uh, uh, you are only now staffing the, uh, this new function of, and this, I guess, will take time. It's not easy to hire a, a thousand people with this very specific uh, competence. So maybe you can tell us a little bit more on the, on the ECB preparation, but also uh, on the relationship between uh, uh, yourselves and the uh, national authorities that have supervised the banks uh, uh, until now, because of course uh, uh, you will rely on them for uh, many functions, but at the same time these are the same uh, national supervisory authorities which in many cases or in certain cases failed to either spot the problems or correct them or were subject to uh, pressure at the national level for uh, you know, maybe overlooking them or uh, not uh, intervening uh, effectively. <clears throat> well, starting from your from your second question, I, I wouldn't frame the discussion in terms of failing or, or errors being made, but more in terms of harmonization and, and consistency. Um, one of the major challenges that this new mechanism will face um, is that the starting point is 18 different supervisory culture. 18 different supervisory uh, handbooks uh, in, the, uh, in the participating countries. Uh, and really the asset quality review and more broadly the uh, comprehensive assessment uh, is uh, the occasion to, uh, to, bring, to bring them together. So not only it, it not only serves a, uh, a stabilization purpose as, uh, as uh, Philippe described, it serves a macroeconomic purpose in a sense, which is to, to, to recreate trust uh, in the European banking system but it also um, serves another purpose, which is to, uh, to kickstart uh, this new uh, supervisory culture and to, uh, to, to bring together all the assumptions uh, taken by national supervisors. So if you take uh, uh, rates of recovery of, uh, of bad loans, uh, um, 
uh, forbearance of, uh, of non-performing loans, all these kind of technical issues uh, that are very important when it comes to the numbers, um, they, will be, uh, they will be harmonized. And they will be harmonized in a way uh, where there will be uh, several checks, uh, because the numbers will be produced by the banks, obviously. Uh, then uh, they will be checked by the national supervisor, then it will be all brought to Frankfurt, and there will be cross-checks among national supervisors. So there will be a, a second pair of eyes, which will be the, the, the eyes uh, uh, of the other supervisors, um, bringing their own supervisory culture and uh, asking questions, and that's, uh, that's entirely new. And then there will be a third pair of eyes, and this will be the uh, independent auditors that uh, we also bring in to, uh, to check some aspects. So uh, as, a, as an auditing process, uh, it will be totally different from what has been done uh, previously uh, to, uh, to check the quality of the assets. Um, coming to your first question, uh, yes, we will hire 1,000 uh, people. It's all open vacancies. It's all on the ECB website, so uh, it's, uh, uh, it's all public. Uh, um, we have headhunters. Uh, we have, we have uh, uh, panels, so it, it is very transparent, very public. Uh, we are starting from the top, uh, so we'll soon uh, hire the... Uh, uh, director generals, so top management of the new uh, of the new uh, 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 authority, uh, and then we'll uh, we'll hire the rest. We have amazingly good uh, um, applications from the private sector at very high level. Uh, also, obviously, from coming from national supervisors because they want to be on board. Um, national supervisors want to be fully on board. They want to uh, to send us their best people. So uh, there is a great sense of uh, of ownership of this new mechanism. Uh, and that's that's the good news that uh, they want it to to work. They want it to be a success. You must pay good salaries because when I wrote a story uh, on uh, this hiring spree mm. of the European Central Bank some time ago, uh, uh, talking to your director of human resources, uh, I got literally uh, hundreds of emails of people uh, asking me how they should apply for this. Uh, so uh, the conditions must be good, I guess. Uh, Philip, one of the big questions about uh, uh, the new role of the ECB will be that uh, they will have to do at the same time their monetary policy role, which have they, they've fulfilled uh, so far, and on the other hand, supervision, which uh, at the very beginning was decide of the monetary union was decided they should be kept uh, separate, and people think that maybe uh, this will test the credibility of the. Uh, uh, ECB in terms of uh, running its, uh, its uh, monetary policy. Of course, you've done it at the, at the Swiss uh, National Bank, and so how do you think this conflict, especially at times of crisis, uh, can be solved? Let me first say on the, uh, on the staff problem, there are lots of private bankers and investment bankers out there who I'm sure <laughs> would love to work in a stable, interesting Environment, Benoit. So I, I have no doubt that um, that you'll be successful. And by the way, from a from a market perspective, I actually think it's very important that you don't just hire from the national supervisors. I mean, part of this confidence game that I described is um, for right or wrong, and some of this I'm sure is not entirely fair. But the markets, by and large, believe that perhaps the key element of banking union is this transfer of authority from the national supervisors to the ECB. And this has to do with many different things, but by and large it has to do with the, the conviction that it is very easy for national regulators to become captured by politics at the national level. And that by moving this <coughs> to the most credible institution in Europe, uh, you can short circuit some of that. And, and I have to say my own experience, and I see some of my colleagues at the time um, in the Basel III reform process under the leadership of Jean-Claude Trichet was certainly that this was and is presumably a big problem that uh, a lot of the political influence came via the national regulators. Uh, and so I do think this, this movement of authority to the ECB is very, very important. So hopefully the single supervisory mechanism will be much more than simply an aggregation of uh, the national supervisors at the European level. I think that's a very important piece of this confidence game to convince markets, the capital markets, that you're creating something new which is distinct and different from simply aggregating 
uh, the supervisors at the national level. Now, you know, on your question, this is a, this is obviously a problem. I think it's a problem that will not be solved in any clean way. Uh, one of the men I admired most in, in our policy circles, who's sadly no longer with us, Tomaso Paraspiopa, uh, always argued for a long time that you can't have the world as clean and as, as simple as we would like it to be. In, in a perfect theoretical world, it would of course be very nice if you could separate entirely uh, regulatory supervisory functions from monetary policy functions. That would keep it cleaner. It would presumably keep monetary policy freer of political influence. That's the sort of traditional German view, which doesn't like this mingling up of monetary policy with other things. But I think as we've seen, I mean, the, to me, the main lesson we've learned in the crisis is that the world is not simple. And uh, whenever you hit a crisis moment, these two things intermingle. And frankly, as we've also seen very clearly, even fiscal policy becomes intermingled at some point uh, with monetary policy to some extent. So the notion that we can sort of solve this in a, in a clean, perfect way anytime soon seems to me to be unrealistic. We have to accept that this is a problem, that we have to do the best we can. Take, take the recent example in the UK. Uh, the funding for lending scheme. Now, in theory, any one of the three committees, certainly any one of the three committees of the Bank of England was affected by the scheme. It was never quite clear who really had authority over it. In the end, when it was ended, it wasn't ended by any one of the three committees, but it was ended in an accord between the governor, Mark Carney, and the chancellor, George Osborne. So suddenly, none of the three committees seemed to have been responsible for it. And I think that shows that even when you try to organize yourself as well as you can, the reality is these things are complicated. And, and to me, I don't think this is a first order problem right now in Europe. I think the most important thing is now to continue this confidence game to make sure that capital mm -hmm. markets reopen for the banks, that we do get to the banks uh, to a robust place because Europe cannot grow significantly above potential as long as the credit channel is clogged and as long as credit is contracting. That's simply not possible. 75% of the European economy is funded by the banking system. If we want to see the kind of growth rates that are gonna generate employment that will bring back stability to the Eurozone, we have to have the, the, the banking channel, the credit channel reopen. And that will only happen if the market regains confidence. We will then have to worry about these things. And I think you know, the best answer in my experience is to be as transparent as possible and explain relentlessly what is monetary policy and what is uh, stabilization or regulatory policy, liquidity policy, and to the extent that you can, try to separate it. I think the ECB has done a great job by separating the standard monetary policy approach through interest rates and the liquidity approach through the liquidity measures that it has taken most recently in the LTRO. I think that's something the Fed didn't quite do as nicely. And some of the reasons around the confusion uh, in terms of QE and the end of QE have to do with not having separated these things as, as cleanly as, as the ECB. But the reality is, even in the case of the ECB, and you see it right now with the discussion around the uh, LTRO, some overlap is going to be inevitable, and the best you can do is to be transparent and, and clear and explain as much as you can. I think Benoit Courier has a comment on your comments. <laughs> no, I agree with Philip that there is no clean way to do it. And by the way, Tommaso Padoasquiopa, uh, whom you quoted, also, also used to say that financial stability is in the DNA of central banks. So we do monetary policy, but financial stability is in our DNA. And I think that's a good way to, to put it. Uh, still, I, I, I believe in separation for, an addition, for another reason, uh, which is uh, accountability. Uh, the consequences of banking supervision are very different from the consequences of monetary policy. Um, if a bank is badly supervised, this can lead to resolution. Resolution, it, it's about property rights. It's about maybe at some point, ultimately, uh, taxpayers' money. This has very different consequences. So the uh, banking supervisor should be accountable their own way to, uh, to parliaments and to the general public. Uh, and that's why we'll have this supervisory board and this chair of the supervisory board uh, who will really will be the public figure of the ECB when it comes to uh, banking supervision. So next year, if you want to discuss banking supervision, please invite uh, Madame Nui. Don't invite me. <laughs> <laughs>
Mr. Bonosterreich, uh, the, the position of the German banks, especially smaller banks, uh, has been uh, different from other groupings in, in the discussion running up to the uh, uh, single supervision. Uh, the, the German, some of the German banks, and well, you have no say in the matter because you've been included in the 128 that are going to be uh, supervised directly by the, by the ECB, but a lot of others fought very hard, and I think the German government supported them uh, to keep out of uh, uh, the supervision of the ECB. Why do you think that is the case, and was there a reason for it? Well, um, in Germany, we didn't have much of consolidation. That means we have a lot of small banks, but the savings banks alone are 418, and the co-op banks kind of the same size. So there are a lot of small banks who are afraid of a complicated European regime, and it is all in English. And I guess that may be an issue elsewhere too. Uh, so that's why they um, take their organizations to influence the government and, and, uh, and hoping that they can stay out of it. But I mean, at the end of the day, the rules mm, are pretty clear. So, I mean, nobody uh, who has a size to be in uh, can get out, and even uh, banks with smaller sizes are in for specific reasons. And so, I mean, there is a level playing field. I mean, this was a situation in the running up, right, because uh, people were just afraid in, 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 very, in very simple terms to answer, to answer that question. Can I just follow up on one sure. point? I think the, we haven't touched on this yet, you know, there are two dimensions to this entire process. Uh, one is to sort of make sure that banks have sufficient capital so they can, the uncertainties can be removed in the marketplace and they can start lending again and the credit channel can reopen. That's clearly going to be the key uh, element from a sort of macroeconomic perspective. But I think there is a second dimension to it and that's the sort of standardization of numbers, of the way you look at balance sheets, uh, transparency ultimately. Uh, and in the long term, I think that's equally important and perhaps even more important uh, from a sort of efficient capital markets perspective, from a banking union perspective. And, and I think rightly, it seems to me from the very beginning, if you look at the communication of the ECB around the single supervisory mechanism and the entire exercise, uh, the ECB has always emphasized, rightly, both of these dimensions, uh, and I think they're both very, very important because one of the problems, one of the reasons why we don't have uh, a common banking market, why we have so much fragmentation, is because it is very difficult for an investor, a global or a European investor, to actually compare uh, investments in banks in Italy, in Greece, in Germany, in Austria, so hopefully one of the things that will come out of this is a much greater comparability and standardization um, of banks from an accounting, from a balance sheet perspective. Now, uh, of course, at the European level, since the start of the crisis, this uh, <coughs> exercise has been done twice already with a stress test of the, in, in a different form, of course, but with a stress test run by the European uh, Banking Authority. So. Uh, and they were not very successful, certainly didn't restore the confidence of investors in uh, uh, the European uh, banks and probably also in banks uh, themselves. Uh, we've seen uh, banks who were tested and found healthy and then failed uh, the next day, not just in Greece but in several countries. Uh, so this time is different, everybody's saying, or is it? So <coughs> Do you allow me to, to take one step back and, and, and just come back on the German perception? Please. Because okay. it is very, very important, and it's really at the heart of the, of the political economy of the banking union. So I think we, uh, this is something that should be clarified. There is a fear in Germany, uh, in the German public, that banking union would be the first step towards mutualization of, of debt, that, that this would be backdoor fiscal union, in a sense. And that's very much uh, perception in Germany. <coughs> what I would like to say here is that, quite to the contrary, a uh, banking union is meant to make the financial system safer in all countries, uh, and so the single supervisory mechanism will have a name to avoid uh, the kind of, of negative feedback loops through banks that we've seen in some countries, <coughs> and that ulti ultimately led to a need for financial assistance. 
So a, a, a good, good single supervision is a protection for taxpayers, including for the German taxpayer. That's very important to explain that. Um, on the stress test and, and AQR, uh, one very simple answer is that uh, this stress test will be preceded by an asset quality review, which hasn't been the case in the, last, uh, uh, in the previous EBA stress test. And there is a paradox here that uh, we've seen in some countries, namely uh, countries under an IMF and EU program or an EU uh, financial assistance program, they've, went, they've been through this uh, asset quality review and stress testing uh, 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 process. So we know more or less what's going on. There may be still surprises, we don't know, but we more or less know what's going on. Uh, in all other countries, including the large uh, uh, Eurozone countries, there was no asset quality review, so we don't know. So really the difference here is, uh, is the asset quality review, is this, uh, this uh, uh, comprehensive and, uh, and very strict auditing of the, of the balance sheet of the banks. And this is a major difference with the previous stress test. So if there are any surprises, we should expect them from uh, Italy, Germany or France. Well, we'll, uh, we'll tell you when we have the numbers. <laughs> Mr. von Osterreich, are you convinced by the uh, argument of uh, Mr. Correa that there will be no mutualization of, uh, of, uh, of yeah. losses or, uh, or not? Uh, I think it should be noted, that I, I don't know if it's commonly uh, known, that uh, uh, Germany has actually spent uh, more money on helping its banks after the crisis than even Spain in terms of... Uh, uh, in terms of uh, percentage of, of GDP, these are the, according to the IMF figures, Germany is actually spent in terms of GDP about twice as, mu mu as much as Spain uh, has spent on its uh, bank. Of course, the Germans will say, well, it's our money, we do what uh, <laughs> we like with it. Well, um, um, obviously I subscribe to the central banker's view. Um, in, in this occasion, because uh, we all fully agree that um, it is a very important part of our future, of the banking industry in the future, especially also for Germany. So we are principally in full agreement. And um, as you just said, uh, Germany did uh, everything in order to stabilize the banking industry. And um, I'm happy to report that actually the last aid was repaid last week. So um, the software which is the agency which helped out the banks um, has no, no more debt outstanding to the system, which means um, that uh, we are on the whole very much uh, on the right way. Now on the, uh, this exercise is supposed to last for about 12 months. Uh, the uh, ECB will take several steps, as you said, uh, they will uh, look at the general risk of the banks then uh, evaluate the uh, uh, balance sheets in the asset quality review and then they will do the stress tests. Uh, 12 months for markets is a very long time. Uh, it can create a lot of uncertainty and it can create a lot of uncertainty for banks uh, as well uh, in terms of uh, uh, risk of short term deleveraging. So things maybe will get better in the uh, longer term uh, in the sense that we will have more stable uh, and better supervised banking system, but in the next 12 months, is there a risk that uh, there will be more deleveraging, heightened volatility, uh, which in turn will worsen the credit crunch, maybe hampering the uh, recovery, Mr. Correa? Well, it's true that 12 months is a long time for, for financial markets, but financial markets are, are forward-looking. So anything that, uh, that will happen over the next 12 months is already uh, uh, in their plans. And a lot of what uh, Philippe has described, I mean, money coming back into peripheral countries, buying um, non-euro area investors, uh, buying uh, bonds issued by banks, including in, uh, in southern European countries, which we are seeing today, which we've seen over the last weeks and months, uh, this is in anticipation of the, uh, of the banking union. So um, if it starts now, it's even better, in a sense. So they are not going to react uh, in November 14. They are reacting, they are taking decisions today, uh, and rightly so. So this we are seeing uh, already. Uh, we will see uh, a certain amount of, I mean, we, we, we have a deleveraging, deleveraging trail trend already in the European economy generally, in the banking sector, certainly. Um, this will be uh, accelerated uh, by, the, uh, by the banking union and by the asset quality review and stress test. Um, 
it's better that it's, uh, I mean, the sooner the better. The sooner the better, because it, when, once it do, it's done, uh, it will free up the capacity of banks to, uh, to lend to the economy. Once banks have the ability to, uh, to restructure their balance sheets, uh, to shed some uh, portfolios of uh, not, very, not very well performing loans to, uh, to guys like, uh, like Philip or, or others that would be happy to buy them, they would be happy to buy them if there is a price. Today, uh, in many places, there is no price because there is too much uncertainty, and that's precisely the purpose of the asset quality review, to, to create trust around the price of these assets. And then, they can be, then there will be a market, uh, then banks can uh, rearrange their balance sheets, and they can create room uh, to, uh, to lend to profitable projects in the economy. So that really serves a positive purpose, which is to, uh, to, um, to recreate space uh, for banks to lend to the economy. Mr. Bornoster, what's your view on that? Will, will your, or is your institution deleveraging, or what you hear from your peers, uh, do, you, do you see much deleveraging going on that may, in the next 12 months, worsen credit uh, provision? Well, I mean, the, the larger banks are concerned, right? And they are already knowing this topic since a long time, and they're working out very, very extensively. So I don't see much of a fear there. And, um, and for all um, other, if you wish, not core financial institutions are stepping in, like the shadow banking system, also insurance companies. So there is compensation. So as far as I can see, there is no shortage of money supply uh, where um, the, the industry is concerned. Uh, obviously, uh, I should speak more for Germany than for other countries. Uh, uh, Philip, you alluded to the, Europe, the U.S. experience earlier. I mean, the U.S. did it the reverse way than the, what the Europeans are, are doing now. They first had the money there, and then uh, Mario Draghi once said, just by magic, the needs corresponded exactly to the money that, were, that, was, uh, that was put there, so everything worked, uh, worked out. The Eurozone is still unclear about the backstop. Uh, there are some proposals on the fund, on the, the way fiscally they should be uh, arranged. Uh, how do you see this ending? Will, in the end, even though they did the reverse process, the Eurozone uh, end up like the US or like Japan? I think the, um, let me put it this way, I think where we are today, sadly, it's taken a very long time to get to where we are today. You know, I keep reminding people we are about to start year six after the crisis, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. So that's unfortunate. And there are many things that, that I feel sad about how long they've taken in Europe. And there's really no reason why they should have taken so long. But, you know, that's history. Europe, as Tommaso Palaschioppa also often said, is a very unique construct and uh, often our American friends still have trouble understanding the complexity of the construct. So certain things take a long time. So we are where we are today. Uh, frankly, if we ended up in a Japanese situation, uh, that would be a sort of unforgivable mistake given where we are today. So I think there is no reason to end up in a Japanese type of environment provided, as I said, that this show can be kept on the road, so to speak. Uh, and I do think that for this next year, this entire uh, banking union exercise is absolutely crucial because it will lay the foundation for growth to come back. Um, the backstop issue is an issue in an ideal world. Again, it would be perfect if we had a clearly committed, you know, European backstop that would enhance confidence in the entire process. Um, I would simply say, you know, I'm not sure the money was really there in the U.S. at the time. I mean, that too, to some extent, was a it confidence was game. It was announced. It was announced. Uh, I think we would have a long discussion to see whether the money was really available and, and, and there. Uh, but it was well done at the time. Uh, here we have a slightly different situation. On the other hand, people overlook over and over again when you hear this backstop discussion. There is still a fair amount, a fair amount of money left that has been committed that has been passed in the budgets that is available in the various stabilization funds. Greece, for instance, has 11 billion dollars, uh, 11 billion euros in its stabilization fund that's there. 
Spain, it's even more than that. A number of countries have capacity left in the funds, and obviously the big countries, like Germany certainly has, has budget capacity uh, if it were to become necessary, and also has some, some funding left quite a bit, in fact, that, that is still earmarked for that. So there is, there is money in Europe. It's, it's not as clean, as neat as it would be if we had a European backstop, uh, but there is some money left. Secondly, you know, one should not over-dramatize the problem. The, even the wildly sort of pessimistic estimates, the worst estimate I've seen of the capital shortfall uh, is 200 billion euros. So the ranges are somewhere between 30 and 200 billion euros, let's say. So let's take the, the sort of wildly pessimistic uh, number that's floating out there. I think it was put out by Price Waterhouse or one of the, uh, one of the firm, one of the big firms. You know, even that number represents 1.3% of the European collective banking balance sheet. So let's not turn this into a story of sort of the entire banking system being insolvent in Europe. Uh, now, 200 billion euros would be a very bad number, would be a very big number. Uh, frankly, I doubt that that's the right number. But even if it were that number, that's not beyond the fiscal capacity of the Eurozone if you look at the countries that still have capacity and if you look at the money that is already earmarked in the various stabilization funds in Europe. Um, over time, of course, part of this Europeanization of the banking system should be and hopefully will be uh, at some point to have a European uh, backstop. There are elements of it today. You have the ESM, uh, you now have significant progress from the way I read it uh, last week uh, on the bank resolution fund. Again, that's something I don't think is fully priced in yet into the market. If the leaders can deliver next weekend, that's a very, very important next step uh, in this so-called mutualization of the banking system in the, in, in the deeper integration of the Eurozone. So would it be nice to have a big European backstop? Yes, of course it would be. Uh, but I don't think the fact that we don't have one that is sort of perfectly set up and clean does not mean that uh, this problem is insurmountable. I think Benoit Corre has something to add on that. Yeah. I will also ask him uh, to clarify one thing. You've mentioned the, the vicious circle or the loop between sovereign sovereigns and, and banks, and uh, there's been some recent discussion about the way uh, sovereign bonds in bank balance sheet should be treated, not so much in the AQR, but in the, in the stress tests, and uh, I think there is a need for some clarity there. <coughs> so I'm happy to, to provide the clarity uh, on that aspect. Um, no, on the, on the capital shortfall, I mean, I'm not commenting numbers, obviously, um, but uh, there is sometimes a perception in the market that any capital shortfall uh, that would arise from the uh, asset quality review and, and stress test would have to be covered by governments. This is no longer the case. I mean, the world has changed. There will be a very clear uh, uh, waterfall of, uh, of, uh, uh, of capital coverage. Uh, banks should first raise capital in the market, and a vast majority of European banks, they can raise capital on the market. So shareholders will not be happy. That's life. Uh, but uh, they will raise capital in the market. And uh, then uh, they can, um, if there is any need for uh, public money, uh, there will be bail-in uh, of uh, some categories of investors. That's under the new uh, competition guidelines. So this is, again, money that will not come from the taxpayer. So the taxpayer really is the last resort, uh, uh, is the last resort uh, contributor. And uh, as Philip said, uh, there is a European backstop, which is the ESM. We did it in Spain. Uh, it works. It worked very well in Spain, so it could be done if needed uh, for, for other countries. But as I said, it's, this is really the last resort a backstop, uh, and there is now a clear, a clear priority. Um, on the uh, Spanish actually needed less money than and, was and they, they, and and they used much less money than, uh, than initially planned. Yeah. They used like, yeah. Uh, um, uh, um, even uh, less than half of the money that was, that was appropriated. Um, on, uh, on, on sovereign exposure, um, there is sometimes a confusion between the asset quality review and the stress test. Asset quality review is really an accounting exercise. It's an audit uh, that has to be done differently. That, that's what we discussed. 
differently from the past, but it is a snapshot of the uh, of the uh, of the of the, of the of the balance sheets and capital uh, levels, uh, equity uh, core tier one equity, uh, um, uh, regulatory capital of the of the banks, uh, and as such, it has to do it has to be done under current rules, and uh, the European rule is CRD four. Uh, this is the way uh, the EU has chosen to transpose Basel III. Basel III does not necessarily uh, force uh, zero exposure on sovereigns. That's not in Basel III, but it is in CRD4. So the ECB as supervisor will enforce European law as it is. We are not going to change European law. That's not the, uh, the purpose of the exercise. Now, of course, uh, there will be a stress test. Uh, and the stress test, uh, it's about uh, uh, scenarios. And the scenarios, they have to apply to all items of the balance sheet of the banks, including capital exposure. So the stress test is really the right place to have that discussion. Now, I thought I understood something of the uh, crisis in European banks, especially Spanish banks. When I, one day I opened the, uh, uh, a copy of El Pais, and there was a picture of one of the chairman, one of the cajas, one of the saving banks that failed, and he was the local bishop. Uh, so I thought, well, something must be wrong here if the bishop is running the bank, no wonder the bank is going to uh, fail. Uh, I'm saying this because uh, we have this synthesis of uh, uh, mixture of interaction of uh, banking and politics in many European countries. Uh, in my own country, uh, one of the most uh, evident cases of uh, uh, failure in management of one bank, which is Monte dei Paschi di Siena, which also happens to be the oldest uh, bank in the world, is because there was so much interference of local politics that eventually the bank was uh, uh, run very badly. Of course, we've had instances of that in, in Germany as well, where many appointments are done on a political basis run on the, comp uh, on the base of competence. I, I wanted to ask Mr. Uh, von Osterreich, if you feel that uh, uh, European supervision uh, will put an end to it, this mixture of banking and politics. Well, um, that's a very difficult question to answer, obviously. Um, we have to find an equilibrium between supervision, external guidance, and um, how to run our business successfully. Uh, currently, obviously, in the run-up to what's going to happen, the balance sheet assessment and the stress test, there's an overburden of administrative work to be done from various parties. So local regulators, the European regulators, um, and obviously if you are a state-controlled bank, um, then um, that is your own government who is highly interested in how things are going on. So at the end of the day, what we're looking forward is that we do have a clear cut, a very precise regime and that we can work successfully um, in, in this regime. And, and, th and that's, um, and I want, like, would like to repeat this here. Uh, for me, uh, World Policy Forum is the most important point that this being sorted in a fashion good for the industry. And that obviously would also help the industry at the end of the day to recover fully and, and to be what it was in the past. Thank you. There's a, we're running out of the spare time that we also uh, had uh, uh, by starting a little bit, uh, starting a little bit late. I have one, possibly one last question for the three of you. Where do you see uh, the European banking industry and its uh, supervisory and regulatory side, say in five years' time, when the dust will have settled on on this, the uh, Um Well, I'm, I'm hesitant to answer, to even answer the question, because that's really a market process. So uh, we should not prejudge on what will be the, the market forces shaping the industry. And it's not only about supervision, it's also about technology, which will be very important. Uh, in the banking in the industry, uh, including over the next five years, e-banking, uh, uh, non-bank competitors, etc. Uh, so I'm not going to be very, uh, to be prescriptive. Uh, that's not my role here. What I would say that I, I would expect the uh, the financing of the European economy to uh, to evolve some somehow uh, away from the traditional uh, European model and towards the uh, Anglo-Saxon model, the U.S. model. 
Uh, not, of course, all the way towards the US model. It's not needed. It doesn't make sense in the European context. But I would expect a little bit less of uh, bank financing, a little, a little bit more of uh, arm's length financing through uh, capital markets, uh, including through uh, securitization. Uh, and uh, if we go a little bit in that direction, this would make the whole system more resilient uh, because it will be more resilient to shocks hitting the banking system, such as the one we've seen uh, in, the, uh, in the current crisis. So uh, a little a more role for, uh, for non-bank actors, a little bit more of the uh, originate to distribute uh, model for bank loans, which of course will, uh, will create issues because we know that the originate and distribute model has failed in many aspects uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in, the, uh, in the US. So this will have to be monitored very carefully. Uh, and one of the big challenges, not really for banking supervision, but for financial supervision generally, will be to, uh, to monitor the ability of non-bank actors to, uh, to, uh, to assess credit, to manage risk, and to follow loans over the life cycle uh, if we want to move in that direction. So for me, that's one of the big challenges. Philippe Hildebrand. Yes, I think that's um, basically right. Uh, perhaps the one point I would add is that hopefully we'll see a consolidation or further consolidation. You know, Greece has gone from 25 banks to five. Uh, I would expect eventually Germany to consolidate. That may take a little longer. So I think uh, what Benoit put out there is, is right, plus hopefully uh, inevitably some consolidation. I think maybe just for the, for the next year, which is crucial because uh, if this confidence game works, it really has to work for the next year. I think we'll see a gradual improvement. Sadly, I think the contracting credit cycle will continue to probably be present for most of the year. Hopefully the, the second derivative will change and, and the, uh, the contraction will become less but I do think invariably part of what's happening, uh, and this is the sort of bad part of the adjustment, is we're gonna start to see, or continue to see some deleveraging, which is gonna weigh on credit, and therefore I, I expect growth to be fairly muted in Europe. On the other hand, we have a global cycle that is on the uptick, and, and we will have a cycle even in Europe, even if structurally things are difficult, the cycle will uh, manifest itself, and then I think you know, the other theme that I'm very optimistic about for certainly for the next maybe year, two years, and something I think is not appreciated enough yet, I think 2014 will be the story of a fantastic re-rating of the periphery in Europe. Um, I don't think Anglo-Saxon investors have fully understood how significant the structural change has been uh, in the south of Europe, uh, primarily Spain, but even in, in Portugal, even in Greece. So I think from an investment perspective, uh, we're likely to see a significant re-rating, a positive re-rating of the periphery of Europe, and, and hopefully this will help this whole banking process in that it will attract capital into the, um, into the banks in, in, the, in the region that's been hurt the most. And then I have this sort of perhaps slightly idealistic hope, and Benoit can comment on this perhaps, or others in the room, since we are almost in France here, um, you know, I, one of the things we can all hope for for the Eurozone, because at the end of the day, France remains a crucial piece of this, and we haven't talked about it today. But perhaps if suddenly France realizes that now it's the South that is outperforming, now it's suddenly the South that looks much more competitive, uh, that that can be an added motivation for France to implement the kinds of reforms that will be necessary to to make the Eurozone truly lasting and stable by having France return to being a strong, unequivocally strong member uh, of the Eurozone. So it's one thing to lose against Germany. Many soccer teams, many countries are used to that. It's perhaps another thing when you start to lose against Spain, Greece, or Portugal. And I think that would be, in a way, a healthy process for the Eurozone as a whole. Well, in terms of soccer, we now got used to uh, <laughs> losing to the Spanish now That's true. for the past several years, uh, constantly one also, right? Well, everything we're talking about now is, will be fully digested in five years' time, and I'm absolutely convinced that the financial industry will have fully reinvented itself. So we, we don't have a f faintest clue today how we will look like then, and I'm pretty sure um, that um, the, we uh, will be in very good shape by then. 
I'm afraid that's all we have time for uh, in this session. I would like to thank our panelists. Uh, the only thing I would take away is the word that he, Philip used at the very beginning, which was fragile optimism. Uh, fragile is also a favorite word of Mario Draghi uh, lately. Uh, I'm not sure if at the end of this panel we should put the emphasis on the fragility or on the optimism, maybe slightly more on the optimism given the uh, view from uh, the markets. Uh, thank you all very much.